Hey, how's it going? Last week we chopped through the game like a hot knife through butter with my champ, and that finished with a record time of 2 hours and 52 minutes, and today we continue our search for the fastest Pokemon in the game. I'm a huge fan of JRes11 and other channels that do similar runs, and a comment I've seen several times was that Starmie would be the fastest. Some were adamant that it would even beat the daunted Mewtwo. I decided to do some research and test this theory out for myself, as Starmie is oddly absent from these channels. Outside of being half psychic helping it out in this quest, Starmie's TM move pool has everything you need. Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, and Psychic provide near complete coverage for the hardest fights in the game, but here's where I see one red Red flag. Starmie starts out with Tackle, Water Gun, and Harden, and it goes without saying that Tackle is one of the weakest moves in the game, and while Water Gun is better than, let's say, Bubble, uh, it's not a powerhouse by any means. The problem is that Starmie doesn't learn any other moves via leveling up, and the great moves it can learn are pretty much locked until you make it to Celadon City. Outside of that, the stats are nothing short of amazing. All of them aren't high, but the two stats that really matter for this type of run are great. Special sits at a very respectable 100, and its speed is great at 115. This means that Starmie will crit roughly 22.5% of the time. So the question here is that if Starmie's high potential in the mid to late game can overcome what looks to be a slow start after Brock. So grab yourself a Sodi Pop, sit back, and let's take a look at Starmie's quest to be the fastest Pokemon up to this point. As with every run, I reset at the start to make sure that I get good DV so that we get a decent representation for the Pokemon in the run, and after that, it's time to battle only the one mandatory bug catcher and face Brock at minimum battles. As you'd expect, Water Gun against his two double weak to water Pokemon make this fight uh, very easy, and things are off to a great start. The route towards Mount Moon isn't challenging, so let's just pick up at rival number two. This fight wasn't too bad, but notice how Water Gun and Tackle aren't really that great, and you slowly start to get the idea of why Starmie's a little bit slow in the early game. And this is a good time as any to say that I did two different Starmie runs after I learned some different strategies. Another thing that holds Starmie back, and that you may not notice at first glance, is that it's also in the slow leveling group, which means that there will be a lot of parts in the game uh, that you're going to be under leveled, and you can't really afford to do much extra battles if you want to be at the top of this kind of tier list. On my first run, I battled extra trainers, but more importantly, I opted to skip Misty since my thought process at the time was that I was going to have to skip Lieutenant Surge anyway, and that it wouldn't make that much of a difference, but I was very wrong. So picking back up after Bill's house, I go ahead and I fight Misty on this run immediately, and I have two reasons for this. The first is that it was really easy when I waited the first time, so I figured it would be doable at this time, a few levels earlier, and that turns out to be the case. Misty's good AI won't use water moves, so it's really just a tackle battle. And remember that you start out with Harden, so since you have the attack badge boost from Brock, you can make your tackles more powerful. And I get really low in this fight, but after you set up your Hardens, you slowly start to outpace her star me, and you pick up a win, and it's much improved in this run rather than the first. The second thing and most important is that now you have access to Bubble Beam, and Starmie has good special, but the knock on it is this early game, you don't have any strong moves, and while Bubble Beam's not necessarily the strongest move, it does help out a lot compared to the first run I did. Now moving on to the SSN, another Starmie problem is that it doesn't learn Body Slam to add to its early game woes. I do pick up the rare candy that the gentleman is guarding before heading over to rival number 3. And here's an example of the difference that Bubble Beam can make. It allows me to one-hit the Pidgeotto, which is usually the problem in these early fights with Sand Attack, and it makes short work of his team. We still have to utilize Tackle some, but at this point, this is about where Starmie starts to pick up a little bit of steam. Now here's the second big audible, the main reason that I did a second run, was that I skipped Lieutenant Surge the first time. This time I'm going to face it. So just like with Misty, when I finally returned to face Surge, I found it to not be that bad with Starmie's high special. And if you can take him out now, you avoid a lot of time loss later so you don't have to backtrack, so I give it a shot. I lose several attempts, but that's mainly due to the fact that I tried this fight at not full health, because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it, and I saved outside of the gym, and I was doing some test battles. But when I do finally decide to heal and give it a full try, I get it done on the first shot. Pikachu does its best to be annoying by paralyzing me, 
I take a Thundershock from Raichu since I'm paralyzed, but honestly it doesn't do a lot of damage. Bubble Beam crits, Lieutenant Surge uses X speed, and a second Bubble Beam gets us past this battle much earlier than the first run, and that means, looking ahead, that we can go ahead and use Fly as soon as we get it, we avoid backtracking, and most importantly, we get access to Thunderbolt, which will help a ton in the coming battles, and no doubt this is the exact moment that saved me most of the time in the run. Moving forward, it's time for Rock Tunnel, but first, let me introduce you to what might be the hardest trainer in this entire run, and I'm not being sarcastic here. This little female junior trainer has two Oddishes and two Bell Sprouts. The first Oddish exists solely just to poison you or paralyze you. After that, it will do super effective damage with Absorb, and it'll start adding up slowly, but you'll get past it. And after you do, Bell Sprouts gonna come in, and it's gonna start using Wrap meaning that every turn it wraps you're going to take poison damage and it's just going to start adding up and adding up and adding up and then if you can finally make it past that another oddish is going to come in and the process is just going to rinse and repeat and this one is very rough and there's really not much you can do to avoid this you have zero ways to deal with grass tops at this point and tackle is your only not resisted move but it's very weak you can't set up badge boost with harden to make it stronger or you'll just get chipped down even faster but eventually you'll get a little bit of luck and you'll survive this nightmarish fight. But I'm not kidding when I say that this might be the hardest part of the entire run. No cap, it's only uphill from here. Inside Rock Tunnel, the two trainers that have Slowpoke seem innocent enough, but in the first run where I didn't do Lieutenant Surge, they proved to be an obstacle that cost me a lot of time. And this is where saving the time on Lieutenant Surge compounds later into saving more time now that I have Thunderbolt. There is another Grass Trainer that's required in Rock Tunnel, but it's not near as bad as the other ones, and that's about it. So moving on, when I'm out, I try the strategy that I did in some of my earlier runs where I go ahead and fight rival number four immediately rather than waiting, and this battle's not too bad. I have answers for most of his Pokemon, but Execute does take several extra turns, so in hindsight, holding off on this fight might have been better, but let's just see if that cost us at the end of the run. After that, it's on to Celadon, and honestly my favorite part about Pokemon Red and Blue this is where the game kind of opens up, and specifically for Starmie, this means that those pesky early game woes are over, and starting from this point on, I have to be as fast as I can if I want to catch or surpass my champ. The first order of business is to enter the Pokemart. I grab a Sodi Pop for the Saffron Guards, and then I trade the fresh water for Ice Beam because grass types can go to hell. I'd like to see that junior trainer come up to me now. I hold off on Psychic for now. I go ahead and I grab the HM for Fly, and then I head to the Rocket Hideout. This means our first run in with Giovanni, and I'm pretty sure Ice Beam would have been just enough for this fight, but I do take advantage of still having Bubble Beam on two of his Pokemon that are times full weak to it. Kangaskhan does take two Thunderbolts to go down, but I take it out, and this fight is easy as always. In the interest of saving time, I go ahead and I face Erica, which I deem a mistake. Or at least it would have been if Starmie's critical hit rate wasn't so high and Ice Beam didn't just absolutely demolish Victory Bell. I get past this fight with relative ease, but it was very risky and dangerous. I think waiting until you get Psychic with its stab bonus is definitely a safer play, but guys, you have to take some risk if you want to be the very best. I head back, I finish up Pokemon Tower, and I think that this would be another spot that definitely I should have went ahead and picked up Psychic before going in here. It would have made it a little bit faster, but we persevere, make it through it, and after that we finally do head to Saffron. I pick up Psychic, and that's essentially Starmie's entire move pool finished up for the rest of the game. Now that I have Psychic in hand, it's time to head down and pay old Uncle Koga a visit with the stab damage Psychic. And this fight's over before you can blink. It's honestly not even fair. A murder was committed this day, guys. Koga's dead. I pick up Sir, and I'm not going to use it on Starmie. I feel that it's not needed, and this leads us to Seal Company, and rival number 5 is next. And let's see how it goes. I have Thunderbolt for the Pidgeot, but I'm a little lower level, so it takes two hits to get past it. Growlithe is up next, and this is why Surf isn't needed. The coverage isn't needed because Psychic can just blast things down. Ice Beam takes out the Execute easily, and then it's Alakazam's turn, the bane of our last couple of runs. And that's not the case here for Starmie. Annoying is a better way to put it. It has high special, and we don't really have a great answer for it, but the bright side is that its moves aren't very effective against us, meaning that it's more tedious than anything. Blastoise is the last Pokemon, and I'll talk about my decision to use Blastoise for the rival later in the video, but we have Thunderbolt, and this dick boy goes down. And that's rival number 5 down in one shot, 
It wasn't perfect, but it also wasn't that difficult, and that's a relief at this point in the run. But Sylph isn't done, and we have a riveting Giovanni number two fight coming up. And when I say riveting, I say that because I ran out of healing items, and I go into this fight at 16 health. 16 measly little health. Fortunately, Starmie is very strong offensively, and while I do take a tiny bit of damage, it's not enough, and once again, Giovanni is very easy. Having this low of HP and still beating it in one shot should tell you everything you need to know, both about Giovanni number 2 and Starmie, but that's still done, and I opt to skip over Sabrina for the moment, and we head down to Cinnabar, and you know what time it is. Tombstoner, brother! And this is the main reason for not using Surf. Uh, this is probably the only battle you would use Surf in. This battle is still very easy. Psychic still shreds, although it's a two shot on the Rapidash, and Arcanine can survive a few due to its massive bulk. But why would you waste a move slot that's only great on this one specific battle, and your other moves provide perfect coverage for the rest of the entire game? If anyone has a reason Surf should be on the final move set, I would actually really love to hear it. I'd like to know what I'm missing. Either way, it's time for Sabrina. And I didn't hold off on this fight because it's difficult. I held off because the AI makes this fight take a very long time. Kadabra gets frozen, which saves some time overall. Mr. Mime and Venomoth are just bumps in the road. But Sabrina's Alakazam will just spam recover, and since we don't have a good answer to it, it can just be a real slog to finally take down. My strategy is to spam Psychic until I get at least one of those nice juicy 33% chances to drop special, and then I try to slowly outpace the recovers, or wait until it uses a different move. The first run of this fight went on until I was almost using Struggle. It wasn't hard, it's just very annoying, and that's the seventh gem down. Now it's time for the last gem, and as we've already seen, Starmie is very well equipped for this fight. Ice Beam is good enough to nuke down the ground tops, and Psychic can deal with the ones that are half poison. Despite Starmie being a little underleveled, it's still extremely fast, and you can tell that by the fact that I outspeed Doug Trio. There's not much Giovanni can really do here, my Pokemon just has the right tools for the job in this case. Next up is rival number 6, and this is more of a showcase of just how powerful Starmie is. I have up to a 10 level disadvantage in this fight, and I still get it done in one shot. And I'm aware that I'll level up at some point in the fight, so I didn't bother setting up any hardens early in the fight. And the Pidgeot takes a couple of Thunderbolts, and the Rhyhorn is easily dispatched with an Ice Beam. This is the point where I level up during the fight, and for one of the first times I actually utilize Harden that's been hanging out in our move pool since the start of the game. I badge boost up on the Growlithe, and then I take it out. This allows Ice Beam to easily take out this annoying egg in a single hit. It's also interesting to note some of the intricacies in the AI. The rival's Alakazam does not have the same one as Sabrina's. It'll actually do not very effective moves and set up Reflect rather than just spam Recover endlessly, which would make the fight a lot more annoying, but it's a lot better than Sabrina. Last up is Blastoise, and although it has 10 levels over me, the badge boost is in my heart, it's in all of our hearts, we're all raising our hands together, and Thunderbolt makes quick work of it. So while I head up to Victory Road, let me briefly touch on why I chose Squirtle for the rival. Well, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Psychic are our damaging moves. The top reason is that I don't want Gyarados on his team, because it's way too easy, it's super weak to Thunderbolt. But if I choose Charizard, that'll make three members of his team weak to Thunderbolt. Pidgeot, Gyarados, and Charizard. If I choose Venusaur, it'll be weak to Psychic, and it still has the Gyarados. And Blastoise makes the most sense because it not only removes the Gyarados from the mix, it adds in Executor, which resists my attacks outside of Ice Beam, and it has decent defenses and it can survive a Thunderbolt, whereas Charizard or Venusaur would just fall prey to those super effective attacks. And that's my thought process on it. It's worth noting that I do skip the final Rare Candy in Victory Road because I'm really worried about the time and I'm rushing as fast as I can to get to the Elite Four. I'm cutting it very close and I'd hate to finish up the game like a minute away or something. So going into the Elite Four, I use all but two of my 10 Rare Candies and now it's time to get to the Elite Four as fast as we can. Let's see how it goes. Lorelai isn't too bad. We are still at a level disadvantage. Dugong will not use Rest due to the fact that it's a Psychic type move and the best you can hope for is Growl, but anything is fine. In this case, we do get some Growls, which makes our job the easiest. Thunderbolt Spam is effective enough to get past both the Dugong, and then the Cloyster will go down easily as well. There's no real hassle at this point. Slowbro loves to spam Growl, 
and generally can't do anything against you. And this is where you need to set up some hardens for the much needed badge boost. After setting up and going for some thunderbolts, that takes us to the Jinx. And this sounds really weird for my videos, but the Jinx is actually really tanky. It's special is pretty good. And if you don't have any super effective moves against it to answer to it, it can be a, a, a hassle. All the extra growls and hardens allow Thunderbolt's neutral damage to one-shot it, and Lapras isn't anything special. As far as I could tell, it'll mainly just use Body Slam exclusively, and while you can't take it out in one shot, two hits usually can. I guess this fight could go bad if you get paralyzed or maybe take a couple of crits, but that never happened for me. And next up is Bruno, and if it's okay with you guys, I'm just going to take a sip of my drink instead of just wasting words on Bruno. What do you think is going to happen? I'm a psychic type and come on, let's just move on. Mo we're moving on. Next up is Agatha, and on my very first run of the game, I did my first ever one shot of the Elite Four, but on the second time I did my Starmie run, it wasn't the case. The same typical things would force a reset. Nightshade damage combined with Hypnosis ends my first attempt. The second attempt, I failed with the same exact thing except that it happened a little bit later on the fight on the Haunter rather than the first Gengar, because sleep is no joke in Generation 1. Overall, this fight isn't that bad unless you get bad hypnosis luck as you've seen. It's annoying that not even two Hardens can make Psychic a one shot on the Gengar, but the boosts do allow you to take everything else out in one hit. If you boost a little bit and make it past the Gengar, the only threat to you is the final Gengar. But I found if you do just one more Harden on the Arbok, a Psychic can actually one-shot the very last Gengar. The only issue in this fight is hoping that during the few turns that Agatha actually get aren't filled with annoying stuff like Hypnosis. Next up is Lance, and although Starmie isn't as tailor-made to crush Lance as Machamp or Ghastly, it does pretty well. Having Thunderbolt for Gyarados always helps out a lot, who would have thought? After that, I find just taking whatever damage the Dragonairs want to give out while you set up enough Hardens to outspeed the Aerodactyl is the optimal strategy. Once you set up, it's time for one shot city. Two Ice Beams for the two Dragonairs, a single Thunderbolt for the Aerodactyl, and an Ice Beam for the Dragonite makes Lance extremely easy for the third video in a row, and I'm all for that after the Growlithe run. Ooh. What an awful run. Next up is the champion, and we one-shot both Rival 5 and Rival 6, so we're done with this run. It's a piece of cake, right? Well, wrong. Despite one-shotting it on my previous Starmie run, I ran into some difficulties this time, so let's sort of take a dive into those hiccups. The first attempt, the quote-unquote not very effective attacks from Alakazam actually crit me and take me down very low. When I make it to Arcanine, I try to set up some Hardens, but I take a good bit of damage from Takedown, and eventually, we get chipped down enough to where the, by the time I make it to the Blastoise, I'm a bloody pulp, I'm just begging for the sweet release of death. The second time, it's that goddamned Alakazam once again. I didn't notice at the time of playing, but this little sneaky snake got a special drop from Psychic, and it absolutely crippled me. It made it to where a two shot would be a four shot, or even more turns, and through the battle I take more and more damage until Blastoise smugly looks at my fainted body once again. I do fail a third run, and what's disheartening is that nothing really awful happened in this run. I just get consistently chipped down, and don't even make it to the Blastoise. I was confused why I was having so much trouble when I literally just one shot the entire Elite Four with the same exact Pokemon a couple of hours ago, and it was pretty maddening, actually. The next run, I have a very anticlimactic experience, especially when compared to the 1 HP Machamp finish. I finally decided to set up some Hardens at the start of the battle, and this is what's needed that allows you to have a much easier time through the first five Pokemon, and by the time I make it to Blastoise, I'm still in green health, and Thunderbolts just finished the job. It's very easy this time. Remember guys, when in doubt, Harden up. Get really hard. That's my motto. Anyways, that's the run. Uh, Starmie got it done, and despite a fairly slow early game, some adjustments made during my second run really made the difference. But how much of a difference did it make? Is Starmie the fastest Pokemon up to this point? Can it beat my champs 2 hours and 52 minutes of in-game time? And I was in legitimate suspense waiting on the time and I'm pleased to announce to everybody that it did indeed beat Machamp's time by the smallest of margins. 
Two hours and 50 minutes flat is the new benchmark for all future Pokemon to beat. Not only that, Starmie was also the lowest level by far due to being in the slow leveling group and not doing much extra battles. Level 57 is pretty impressive, I have to admit. And there's no doubt that Starmie is the new top of the tier list. There's no arguing it. If you're curious, my first run where I skipped Misty and Lieutenant Surge and then I went back for Misty and then I backtracked to Lieutenant Surge later, that run ended at 3 hours flat. And I'm not sure how I feel about this, you know? Let me try to articulate what I'm trying to say. And it's basically that retrying a run makes me feel a little bit unfair, a little bit biased, I guess. Because what if I retried the Machamp run with the full knowledge of the previous run? Don't you guys think that I could shave off at least three minutes and retain the top spot? So I'm feeling a little iffy about this, but my only attempt at justifying this is that I felt I made a clear mistake in my pathing with Starmie, and I felt that it deserved a second shot rather than just being wrote off as worse than what it actually was, whereas with my champ, I thought I did the pathing very well and there's not much that I could have done to make it better. And I will say that there are a couple of spots in the Starmie run that I could have saved even more time. So if I was to, say, do a third run, I think I could do at least like 2 hours, 47 minutes or something like that. Anyways, this has been a really fun one and I was really interested to see if it lived up to the hype. And it did. The early game was not great. And it's very impressive that it was not only able to make up the time loss from the first parts of the game, but also it erased the entire deficit and got the new top time in the later half of the game. This feels like a really high bar to set, and I'm interested to see if we can beat these high scores once again. But that's about it for me. If you enjoy this content, I'd appreciate you if you subscribed and hit that bell for future videos. I also love reading and responding to the comments. That's something I don't get a lot of, and it, it bothers me, honestly. So anything you have to say, please don't hesitate to let me know. And with that said, I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!